Why do unions matter? Because we are always stronger together. One individual can change the world, but it's a whole lot easier when you've got a whole bunch of buddies with you. You know, they're, they're, throughout history, really the only way we've gotten ahead has been working collectively, been working together, ideally across racial and gender and generational and linguistic lines. Like those are the times we've won, we've won big. When you're just one person, sure you, you know, theoretically have rights. Sure, you can stand up for yourself, but you're vulnerable, right? You don't have anyone who has your back. I really think unions and organizations of working people are kind of one of the only almost universal unifying institutions available to people in this country because almost everybody has a job or has had a job or will have a job. That's the trouble of trying to exist under capitalism, right? You peel away a layer here or there and suddenly you're the asshole because there's, <laughs> cause, cause there's no winning, right? The system is set up in a way that nobody wins except like seven guys. It's difficult that we live in a system where the onus is placed on individuals to act equitably and responsibly and for us to be the good guys because all the corporations and the people in charge are allowed to be bad, it's on us to, to fix it, right? It's like, if you personally don't recycle, all the sea tilters are gonna die. How do you feel about that? <laughs> like, let's not talk about, you know, wh why it got like that in the first place. The thing about Sideshow as an art form, as opposed to magic, for example, is that it is real and it hurts. <laughs> a lot of the skills I picked up, like, you know, breathing fire or walking on glass or setting off a mousetrap with my tongue or sticking my arm in a bear trap or uh, swallowing swords. That stuff is real and it's spectacular. <laughs> I was uh, born with this uh, condition called ectrodactyly, which uh, the cliff notes of that is I have eight fingers and they're arranged in interesting ways. <laughs> <laughs> And there are a lot of other sideshow performers throughout history who had this same thing, uh, usually billed as like a lobster boy or a lobster mm. girl. My, my Coney Island stage name was Greta the Lobster Girl mm. because I also have long blonde hair and look a little <laughs> bit like a Swedish milkmaid, you know. <laughs> so it, it made sense to me at the time. <laughs> but yeah, that experience of going to the sideshow school and being in an environment where there is this kind of inverted hierarchy where folks traditionally in this world, if you're a natural born, if you're born different, you're you're at the top, you're, you're top dog. Because you can't fake it, you can't learn it. You can't fake it. It's my Bialik's breakdown, she's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's gonna break down, it's a breakdown, she's gonna break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. Flying solo today, but that's okay. Jonathan will be back another day. Today, we're going to be breaking down the untold history of American labor fight like hell, which is an incredible book by Kim Kelly. And Kim Kelly, in case you don't know, she's uh, an independent journalist, she's an author, and she's an organizer. She's been writing for Teen Vogue since 2018. But here's the kicker she writes on labor, class, politics and culture. She's also written for everywhere, The New Republic, Washington Post, The New York Times. She was an original member of the Vice Union, member Vice, and she's a third generation union member. She's also an elected council person for the Writers Guild of America East. She was born in Jersey. She's participated in the Coney Island Sideshow School for so many reasons. She ran an anti-fascist metal festival She's an incredible woman, and she's going to talk about why it matters to care about people in labor unions, why we should care about unions, why so many of us have relevance in this community, and she's just an awesome, awesome person. Kim Kelly is going to join us, and it is such a pleasure to welcome her to The Breakdown. Break it down. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you for so many reasons. Um, and I, I want to, as I talked about in the intro, I want to, um, just highlight 
Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor, um, which is your book, which looks like this. Um, and um, I want to, you know, commend you for the the amount of passion that must go into a project like this. Um, you know, you you wear a lot of hats and um, you've done a lot of incredible things in the culture space. You've done a lot of incredible things in your own personal space. But, um, you know, the fact that you have, have written this book and um, are kind of not only putting yourself out there, but really pulling the veil back on an aspect of, you know, of American history that many people vaguely know about. Um, but the fact that you've kind of done it in, in one place, I think, with this kind of punch um, is incredibly powerful. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about... Um, why this book? Meaning you have so many experiences, um, you know, you, in particular, you as a woman have been such a pioneer in spaces that, that people typically don't see women. And, you know, you, you've chosen though to highlight, you know, really aspects of, you know, what many of us academic feminists uh, believe is one of the most important aspects of feminism is highlighting not only the role of women, but people of color, um, you know, un underrepresented populations. And why this book? Why why write this way from your perspective? Well, first, I think this is the book that I could have really used when I started getting interested in labor and the labor movement, because I'm still relatively well, maybe not anymore. It's, it feels like at least I'm still relatively new to this world. I spent most of my existence in the music business, uh, which we can talk about a, a little later. That's mm -hmm. a that's a whole other wild story. But um, yeah, I became involved in labor because I helped organize my workplace. That's the way that I think most people get involved in labor or even hear about the labor movement at this point by doing it. And when I I, I was so enthralled with the history, with everything I was learning from our organizers, from our lawyers, just the entire thing was the most fascinating thing in the world to me. I I, I described it to someone as, like, as if labor had become my new favorite band, you know? <laughs> so like, and as someone who's been in the heavy metal world, like having an encyclopedic knowledge of that world, I'm, I'm very well disposed to memorizing lots of new acronyms and mm. new facts and new names. It was just fun. And I wanted everybody who was interested in labor, involved in labor, to have that same experience of finding people that looked like them or felt like them or came from the same place they did and seeing themselves reflected in the movement. Because one thing that I found as I was reading more and more books uh, was that the stories I was most interested in didn't seem to get quite as much attention. They were harder to get to because obviously academic researchers and historians had already done this work, have been doing this work. They're like, they're the real MVPs, right? But as someone who was just, you know, a heavy metal dirtbag getting interested in labor, I didn't have access to, you know, the academic libraries or JSTOR or any of the places where all these really cool, important documents live. And, you know, I wasn't in school. I didn't have, I don't think I've even taken a journalism class, which is a whole other thing. Um, but I, I was just, you know, just a, just a person and I wanted to learn more about it. And I thought taking the opportunity I had to write a book and taking all these stories I, I had found thanks to the work of people that came before and making them really accessible. Mm -hmm. That was the way to really get it out there. I, I wrote it and structured it in a way that I wanted people to be able to pick it up and read it on their lunch break or page through it on the bus. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to seem like a big lift. I wanted it to, to seem fun and inspiring and interesting and sometimes infuriating. Like, you know, I'm not a novelist. I don't think I have the chops for that, but I can tell a decent story. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really emphasize the human aspects of these pieces of labor history that, you know, unless you had a really good professor or a very specific speci specialization, you just weren't going to come across in like a regular, regular American education. <laughs> well, and I think that's also um, sort of what's, so fun. I mean, I know it's an odd word to use when describing a book that like is describing some of the, the hardest aspects, really, not only of of labor in America, but also of American history. Um, but the the kind of fun part is that there there are personalities behind each of these movements. 
And, you know, you 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 break down the book kind of almost by profession. Right. And you have kind of the the history of some of the classic, you know, um, the classic labor issues. Right. That first evolved um, in in the last century. Um, and and you do you're you're telling stories. And I think that's also, you know, the the notion of like breaking the bonds of race, class and gender like that's this book kind of does that chapter by chapter. Um, can you speak to this notion of, and I hate to like make you talk about it, but I think it's important. Can you speak to the diversity that is inherent in the labor movement when I think many of us still have this notion of like, I don't know, like white dudes with shovels, like, you know, we're the workers of America or like, I don't know what white men do in those posters, but you know, like <laughs> that's kind of the notion. And then when you when you peel back, you know, kind of the history of of mining, of garment workers, of field workers, you know, of sex workers, right? This is a diverse set of stories. Can you talk a little bit about that diversity? Yes. And you're so right about the white guy in a hard hat that is presented <laughs> as the archetype of the American worker. When politicians go up and talk about American jobs or American workers, that's who they're envisioning. And that's generally who they're if they're trying to do anything, that's who they're trying to target. <laughs> um, but it's, and just even in the most basic terms, like the most likely person to be in a union in this country is a Black woman who works in a hotel or in the service industry. Mm -hmm. That's just like, I'm not even a data guy, but that's just the reality. I think the highest rates of union membership are among Black men and then Black women. And mm -hmm. that already kind of throws a little bit of a spanner into those works. And just the idea that the working class is one specific thing is so, it's, it's silly and it's reductive and it's harmful because when you're presented with this idea as working class is one specific thing, it's guys like my dad who work construction and live in Jersey and have terrible <laughs> political views. <laughs> that we, you know, I love my dad, but we argue. <laughs> So he, so yeah, my dad is part of it, but then so is almost everyone else. If you have a boss, if you are, you know, being paid for your labor, if you're not in control of your own destiny at work, you're probably part of the working class too. And mm. there's a whole heck of a lot of us. I mean, the labor movement is not a monolith, mm -hmm. even when it comes to some of our most important figures, whether they're well known or not. There's a whole lot of them in my book. It's so many of the people that did the most work or fought the hardest or struggled for the longest were the women, were the queer and non-binary folks, were the Black and Brown and Indigenous and Asian and Latino workers, like were the disabled workers, the sex workers, people mm -hmm. who have been criminalized. The only reason we have any of the rights or legislation that we do that protects workers is because of their sacrifice, because they had to work even harder. Mm -hmm. And then their reward for far too many were that they were either written out of history or mm -hmm. sanitized or, you know, kicked out of the labor movement, blackballed, red scared into submission. <laughs> there's the, and it, there's, we all fit. Like there, for any person who's involved in labor right now, whether you are a coal miner in Appalachia or a Starbucks worker in Kansas City or a tech worker in California or a garment worker also in California, big shout out to LA. Like there's <laughs> someone just like you has already done a lot of the work, has already put in those blood, sweat, and tears. And they belonged then just as much as you belong now. Mind Balance Breakdown is supported by Nutrafol. Ever wish you had visibly thicker hair? Yes. How about less shedding? Uh-huh. Maybe stress is causing your hair to thin, or is it the other way around? There are multiple root causes of hair thinning, and Nutrafol addresses key root causes through a whole body approach to hair health. Are you tired of dealing with thinning hair? Nutrafol is here to help. Their hair growth supplements use drug-free ingredients to target root causes of thinning hair and promote healthy hair growth. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement clinically shown to improve visible thickness and strength. From postpartum to menopause to plant-based lifestyles, and no matter your life stage, Nutrafol has four unique formulas to support women. Each is physician formulated using drug-free, science-backed ingredients so you get the most reliable results. Go to Nutrafol.com to take their hair health wellness quiz. Identify the causes of your thinning hair, and Nutrafol gives you a personalized plan 
for better hair growth through their whole body health approach. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and metabolism through whole body health. Nutrafol is also now available in a vegan formula. Yay! Their newest supplement is formulated for women ages 18 plus with plant-based lifestyles who are experiencing signs of hair thinning. I just started. In a clinical study, 86% of women reported improved hair growth after taking Nutrafol's women's hair growth supplement for six months. Those are the stats I'm interested in. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol's offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and Free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code BREAK. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code BREAK. That's Nutrafol.com, promo code BREAK. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by Stitch Fix. Wouldn't it be great if you had the right wardrobe to match your evolving lifestyle? Whether you're picking up a new activity, looking for maternity wear, or simply bored of your old choices, the stylist at Stitch Fix makes sure you always have something to wear. Stitch Fix is the best way to shop new styles and brands. Think of them as your own style partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks that you love without breaking the bank. You just share your style, your sizes, and your budget with a quick style quiz, and Stitch Fix will send you five items in a fix right to your door. With your choices in mind and sizes from extra small to triple XL, they will find your perfect fit. Try everything on at home. That's my favorite part. Keep what you like and send back the rest. Shipping and returns are always free. They have over 1,000 brands and styles. No matter what season of life you're in, Stitch Fix has got you covered. Simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular fixes. You are in control. Over time, Stitch Fix and their season style experts will match you with greater precision to perfect pieces for you based on your likes and dislikes. It's so easy. I love Stitch Fix. I've used it for years. I've used it for me. I've used it for my kids. And I wanted to spruce up my wardrobe recently. And I met a stylist that really has got me figured out. It is so much fun. And the fact that shipping is so easy if you need to return anything, that's awesome. A big thank you to Stitch Fix. They just get me and they'll get you too. Try today at stitchfix.com slash break. You'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash break. Stitchfix.com slash break. I love that you write for Teen Vogue and you write about <laughs> these things. I mean, you obviously have um, a, a lucrative, you know, you're an independent, you know, journalist and you have this awesome book. And you, you also, though, you choose to bring topics up and especially the fact that, you know, that kind of publication, right, is is wanting you to bring these kind of issues up. Um, I wonder if you can speak to, like, I think a lot of people, and, you know, I, I'm from a, you know, my grandparents were sweatshop workers. Um, they were immigrants to this country. And, you know, my my dad was a public school teacher. My mom began as a public school teacher. So, like, I just, I'm, I come from union people. And, you know, I was always taught about the significance of the union. And then I studied Marxism in college. And I was like, I get it. I really get it. <laughs> That's um, how they get you. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and, you know, I've always been this, like, you know, oddball, like, environmentalist. And, like, I promise that democratic socialism can work. And, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, people were like, you're on crack. Why don't you shave your armpits? Which is, like, most <laughs> of, you know, my teen years. But it's funny because now people like Kim Kelly write articles about these things. <laughs> and, like, it's a thing. And you wrote a book about it. There's also been a, a large set of conversations around unionizing. And I read a, a fascinating article about SALTS, um, about, you know, college-educated kids who basically go into places that are not unionized to try and educate people. I'm going to ask you to explain it really plainly. Why do unions matter? Why are people all up in arms about unions? Why are people encouraged to unionize? Like, why is it a thing? And unions sometimes get a bad rap. But why do unions matter? Because we are always stronger together. One individual can change the world, but it's a whole lot easier when you've got a whole bunch of buddies with you. You know, they're, they're, throughout history, really the only way we've gotten ahead has been working collectively, been working together, ideally across racial and gender and generational and linguistic lines. Like those are the times we've won and we've won big. When you're just one person, sure, you, you know, theoretically have rights. Sure, you can stand up for yourself, but you're vulnerable, right? You don't have anyone who has your back. An individual worker, you can go up and talk to your boss and say, I want to raise. 
they say, okay, you're fired. Or Mm -hmm. if I'm not going to fire you, I'm going to make your life worse. Or I'm just going to ignore the quest altogether. But if 20 of you show up or 200 of you organize Mm -hmm. and force them to meet you across a bargaining table and sign a legal document, that power dynamic shifts considerably. You know, it all comes down to power. Who has it? Who deserves it? Who Mm -hmm. wants some? And just figuring out how to get a little piece of it back for yourself and for your coworkers. I I tend to, as someone who also got into radical stuff pretty young and and kept on trucking, I have a lot of views about greedy bosses and CEOs Mm -hmm. and the uh, distribution of resources and wealth in this country. And then I'm also in a union with people that want to get rich or want to at least, or think I'm like a bomb throwing radical and have no interest in what I have to say. (laughs) But because we're in that union and we have those shared interests of getting a good contract, of being treated properly, of taking care of our coworkers, we work together and we achieve that bigger goal. I really think unions and organizations of working people are kind of one of the only almost universal unifying institutions available to people in this country because almost everybody has a job or has had a job or will have a job. You know, labor is as close to a universal experience you can get outside of birth, death, and taxes if you're not rich. <laughs> and being able to access that power and access the resources that come with organizing and getting involved with the union or starting your own dang union. You know, independent unions exist. The IWW is still out here. There's so many different ways to organize and to fight back and to seize at least some of that power for ourselves. And I just think it's it's silly when folks like say have all of these criticisms of unions without acknowledging the good that they've done and the good that they can do. And the fact that a union ultimately is without all the layers of bureaucracy, red tape or legal this, NLRB that, a union is a group of workers who come together to try and make a change. You... And your friend at work, you could be a union if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. It just, it comes down to people working together to achieve what they deserve. It's a beautiful and 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 simple analysis because it really is. It's like a complicated problem that has a simple solution, right? But one of the things that I also would like you to speak to is I get really emotional apparently when we talk about unions. <laughs> I Because get... I, <laughs> it's just like I already started crying. Um <laughs> You know, the the notion that the people united will never be defeated, like this is one of the sort of, you know, classic cries that, um, you know, that you hear, you know, usually during strikes or, you know, <laughs> chills. But one of the one of the most challenging things, you know, just for me as a human is when we come to topics like this and you have to, like, explain to people why unions are important. Right. I uh, unfortunately. It's also like I'm a vegan, which is another sort of radical thing to be. And it's kind of like when people ask why be vegan, there's all the like nice answers you can give. And then there's like the five things that no one wants to hear about what really happens, right, in factories or to workers in factories, you know, that are producing, let's say, animal products. But I'm going to leave that aside because when... When you talk to people about unions, you can say all these things, right? And you hope that that will stir, you know, the proletariat inside of them. But the truth is that there are horrendous and disturbing things that happen when people are not protected by a union. And it's kind of like, I keep that in my back pocket and you chose to put it, you know, throughout the pages of this book. People don't want to hear that it has been a standard practice to sterilize women to make them more, quote, efficient workers. People don't want to hear that women are forced to have abortions if they get pregnant because it disrupts the labor that needs to go on to produce a product, right? So I'm just picking two ugly things. Um, I want to point out that, you know, your book is... It's not an easy read emotionally, because if you want to understand the culture of labor, if you want to understand literally this country and the foundation of what we know of as this country, which existed long before we declared it this country, you you have to understand some hard things. 
And I want to know just from you kind of like as a human person, what is it like to try and communicate such painful things for this cause? And how do you do it? Like, how do you stomach it? And then how do you deliver it, you know, in ways that people will hear it? Gosh, writing this book broke my heart a million ways to Sunday, you know, <laughs> especially because I, I started writing it and really wrote the whole thing uh, in like 2020, earlier in the pandemic mm-hmm. when I couldn't leave my house. So just me and my books and my pirated JSTOR articles and the people <laughs> I was calling on the phone. Honestly, shout out to my friends who are PhD students who got me the good stuff because I don't have a .edu. <laughs> but... <laughs> And it was it got overwhelming sometimes. Like I def, there's definitely you know theor, like metaphorical teardrops on these pages because it is so ugly, and it's still happening. That's the worst part. Mm-hmm. Like going through and telling these stories, what people had to go through, what children had to go through, what immigrants had to go through, what disabled folks had to go through, and are still going through. It just it kind of drains the life out of you. But then things that I cling to, it's, I don't know if it's a a Pollyannish instinct or just residual PMA from the hardcore scene. Like you you find the silver linings, right? Like they, like these people fought so hard and they got knocked back and the government sent in some troops to shoot them and someone's child got burned alive. And oh my God, this is terrible. But 50 years down the line, they won. Like holding on to that hope. I think the hope is really the biggest underlying theme of the whole thing. Because if we didn't have hope, we wouldn't have tried any of this in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't still be trying. You know, one of it's is interesting thinking about the the ugly stuff and the way that it's talked about now. Something that drives me a little a little to distraction is (laughs) the the current kind of outrage around child labor and the rollback of child labor laws in places like mm. Arkansas and, so, and probably a bunch of other him have it on the docket. And the thing about that, which you'll see in reading my book and also maybe in paying a little bit more attention out there, is that it never it, it never stopped. Mm. Like this isn't a brand new thing. <laughs> right. It's um there have been children and specifically children of color, immigrant children who have been working in the slaughterhouses and the factories and the mm-hmm. fields since since we had those things. You know, all the child labor laws that were instituted, they weren't for those children. Mm. There are carve outs, there are exceptions. All of our major labor laws, even the pretty good ones, they leave people out. And they left people out back then in the 1930s and their past. And as things have evolved and work has shifted, even more people have fallen by the wayside. And we haven't had that massive labor law reform and that that massive update that we need. So now there are whole new categories of workers who don't like Teddy Roosevelt and his buddies never thought about Uber. Mm -hmm. They weren't thinking about the rights of sex workers. They were not thinking about, you know, what happens if you're a 14 year old kid working in a slaughterhouse in Alabama and your parents get deported. Like there's, that's why I wanted to write a book like this and showcase the stories of folks like this because like, they shouldn't have been left out. And now that hopefully we're a little bit more enlightened or at least paying a little bit more attention, we need to make sure they're not left out again or anymore. Like we need to, there's no excuse anymore, right? We have history books. I wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was looking at, you know, some of the articles that you've um, that you've written for for Teen Vogue. Um, I mean, I just think you're so friggin' awesome. But um, <laughs> you know, I was looking through these articles and I was like, oh, this is like you're you get to write about things that people don't want to think about, but you get to write about them in a way that makes people not able to look away. And one of the things that you tackled, and like, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to talk about it. You wrote this article about occupational disease and women, and um, it came out this year. And, you know, you kind of, it's, it's really, like, you're so my people, 
Like if if we were at a party, like you're who I would corner and be like, tell me everything. <laughs> like I want to know everything. <laughs> like I'll get you another beer. Um, but you know, talking to people about what happens to people who do manicures, for example, that's a hard one. D- do you ever feel like I can't go here? Like no one wants to know because people, you know, in many cases, they don't want to know. It's yeah, like, that, that's the trouble with trying to exist under capitalism, right? You peel away a layer here or there, and suddenly you're the asshole because there's because <laughs> there's no winning, right? The system is set up in a way that nobody wins except like seven guys, mm-hmm. and so. Uh, the nail salon one is interesting. I've covered it a couple of times over the years because I think it's so interesting because it is so ingrained in so many people's lives, whether they're folks who are paying hundreds of dollars for really fancy nails or someone like me that goes and gets their nails done once every couple of years when they're feeling brave. Like, it's just something that you you do sometimes. And of course, you know, the workers are not treated as well as they should. There's so many layers to the way they're treated poorly, whether it's the way the customers are treating them, because not everyone is nice to service workers. Most people, uh, I would say, are not very nice yeah. to service workers. And it seems like they've gotten worse. No one knows how to act anymore. Mm-hmm. And then there's the like the, the issues with some of the workers, obviously not all, some of the workers have complicated immigration statuses or their mm-hmm. newer arrivals to the country. So they have some stuff going on there or there's a language barrier or there's a housing issue or they're being outright exploited. And while all of that is happening, they're breathing in chemicals. And all of this is so your nails can look pretty. And that's really hard to justify. Get, people get so mad. <laughs> they get really mad. It's like talking about prison labor or about like fast fashion and why that $5 halter top costs like an hour and a half of someone's life. You know, it's it's difficult that we live in a system where the onus is placed on individuals to act equitably and responsibly and for mm-hmm. us to be the good guys because all the corporations and the people in charge are allowed to be bad. It's on us to to fix it, right? It's like, if you personally don't recycle, all the sea tilters are going to die. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Like, let's not talk about, you know, why it got like that in the first place. But I think the thing that I like to write about the most that makes people a little squirmy um, is incarcerated workers, people in prison and what happens to them with their jobs. No one wants to think about what happens in prison because this notion is like, we send them there to make them better so they don't commit crimes. I mean, like, that is not what happens. Yeah, it's literally sending someone to crime college. <laughs> like, like it's when I was writing this book, one of my best friends, he was incarcerated in Rikers. And he actually wrote about him. He helped organize uh, a strike while I was there earlier mm. in COVID when they were not getting soap or masks or anything. And mm. they were crammed in these dorms. They they led you know, him and some of his well, co-workers led a strike. And they got what they needed. And that's a labor story. Why do prisoners need rights? You know, it's as if people lose their humanity once they walk into a slightly different building. Hmm. Whether or not they should, I mean, there's lots of big essential questions about whether anybody should be in a prison, right? That's, <laughs> that's probably a whole other episode. But it's just the the lack of, humanity and grace and empathy extended to incarcerated people. Mm. It filters out in the way that people see prison labor and incarcerated workers. Like they're part of the labor movement. They're Mm. our brothers and sisters and siblings. When they go in, when they come out, if they never get a chance, either way, they are working either for a wage or for nothing. They have a boss, they have hours, but they don't have the opportunity to say, hey boss, I'm not feeling so good. I'm going to go home for the day. No. You get back to your you get back to work. You don't have any rights. And something that I came across when I was writing the book, I should have to shout out my friend Victoria Law, who is another brilliant author and and just the best. Um, she mentioned while I was interviewing her about something else, she mentioned, hey, there was this Supreme Court case at one point you should look into that has something to do with prisoners' unions. I was like, okay, Vicky, I'll Google that. <laughs> um, but I found it. The Jones 
I think it was 1977, the Jones versus North Carolina Prisoners Labor Union. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's it's all in the book, but essentially the Supreme Court ruled that people in prison don't have the right to organize. They don't have mm-hmm. the right to form a union. And that when that came out, it just stamped all over decades of incarcerated worker organizing. Like it's, and that's complicated. That's not nice. Like mm-hmm. they're police in a lot of organized labor unions. And it's it's all complicated and it's messy and it brings in people's opinions about things. But I'm going to keep hammering towards it because even though my friend is not stuck there anymore, a lot of other people are. And until they're all free, they're going to need someone and a lot of someones to care about them and talk about them and embrace them in the spirit of this movement. Because if an injury to one is an injury to all is something we're going to continue to hold on to. That means all, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, moving to a slightly lighter topic that you also wrote about. I have to bring it up. This one freaked me out. Flight attendants. This one rocked me. So I- increasing, increasingly high rates of a variety of cancers in flight attendants And, uh, you know, some of the reasons that you talk about uh, radiation, right? Like chemicals there. And then like disruption of circadian rhythms, which like the scientist in me was like, of course, because I would always tell people, because once you learn this in as an undergrad, you know, neuroscience student, you tell everyone because you want to be that popular. (laughs) You can't force your body to need like two hours of sleep. Like it's not like, you know, when people are like, I work a night shift and I'm fine. Your body always knows something's wrong. Like even if you like you nap in the day, like your body always knows that when the sun comes up, like we're mammals, we're animals, like your body always knows. So when you pointed that out, I was like, oh my gosh, like the flying the friendly skies and like this this job that like so many women also it was like their way out, you know, for many of them. It was like a life of adventure and excitement. And yeah, these are some of the things that happen at jobs that matter and that people need protection around. And it doesn't make it convenient because what it's if we start thinking this way and your book talks about this, once you start thinking this way, the machine has to change. You cannot have the same productivity when you care about people as you do if you don't. And like, that's just like Marx and Engels, folks. Like, it's very, very basic stuff. But the flight attendant one really rocked me. Yeah, and thankfully they have a really strong union. That's how they've Mm -hmm. gotten to be. And they're actually one of the most like militant unions out there. Their Mm -hmm. president, Sarah Nelson, she is a force. But... Yeah, without all that organizing and agitating and protesting, things would still be worse for them. They would still be having to step on a scale mm-hmm. and have to quit as soon as they get married or pregnant. Like, and that, you know, th- those changes happened and the world didn't fall apart. So I'm mm-hmm. sure some other ones could be implemented to keep them safe from breast cancer and extreme stress and sleep deprivation. Like there's there's always a way to do a little bit better. We've hmm. we've gotten, things have gotten a little bit better over the years and the world didn't explode. So it stands to reason there's still some room for improvement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the WGA? Um, this has been something that a lot of people um, have, hadn't really thought about, you know, until it sort of, hit the industry now, you know, the last writer's strike, many people say, was the birth of reality television uh, because that's kind of what happened is a lot of scripted stuff went down. I was just starting on Big Bang Theory when the last writer's strike um, finished. And so this one, it also feels like social media is different this time. Like, everybody seems to be hearing more about it. Um, can you Can you talk a little bit about sort of you know, the WGA and, you know, many of us who who know writers and love writers, you know, we know that the people at kind of the highest levels of their writing careers, like this, this is not, a, obviously it impacts everyone, but this is not a do or die strike for them. But there are many young writers um, and and many people who are new to writing rooms whose really their, their livelihood is kind of hanging on this strike. You know, no one likes 
that we are striking. Um, but can you can you talk a bit about sort of what's at stake, like for people being like, I've heard there's a writer's strike. <laughs> it's honestly, we're facing this existential crisis, like this this moment for our industry, our industry writ large, which includes, you know, the DGA and SAG-AFTRA and IASI, everybody involved in the production of media on that coast and in New York and everywhere else. Like it's, it's a big sprawling issue. And one of the biggest issues besides uh, residuals, which our, our workers are not getting because of the rise of streaming, which I guess could be, you know, talking about how reality TV was born of that strike, you know, streaming popped up between that strike and this one. So now we have to retroactively fix all the problems that happened with that. And also, just to clarify for people who may not be thinking about this, so residuals, um, you know, as actors and and writers, you get paid when something that you wrote or created um, or participated in, you get paid a a, a small percentage. Um, but for many people, residuals is sort of what keeps their career going, meaning you get a lump sum to write something or you get a lump sum to be in something. But then every time it shows, it's an acknowledgement that people are purchasing your labor. And so what happens with streaming, as many of you have experienced, you can watch something as many times as you <laughs> want and the money goes to your monthly subscription. But the actual creators, and again, this is how a society is structured. You know, everybody gets paid and we all kind of work together the actual people who created that labor are not seeing that. So that's what residuals means, right, when we talk about yeah. streaming. And that's why so many writers, especially younger, newer writers who are getting on, on the, the Hulu, Netflix, et cetera, boom, like they're not getting paid for that work. And so they're struggling. It's And of course, it's one of those jobs. Like I write, I'm a screenwriter. I write for TV. It sounds glamorous, right? But <laughs> so many of our, our members are not making very much money. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them don't even make enough to qualify for uh, the writer's skills health insurance, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Many people are losing their health insurance because of this. And people don't realize that either, is that there are you know, part of the thing about being part of a union is often you have to have a certain amount of um, dues that you pay, which are usually based on earnings, um, but you have to have a certain number of hours um, to maintain your standing in a union, which is what guarantees in many cases your insurance. So the trickle-down effects of this is also people who do hair and makeup and wardrobe, all those people whose livelihood is this, um, many people are losing, you know, their, their insurance because of their union status, which is obviously super complicated and a, a product of our broken system in general. Um, but I just wanted to to clarify that as well. A lot of these young writers are also, they're women, they're people of color. They are, you know, writers who are coming up in, you know, a culture that is finally recognizing the need for those voices in writing rooms and also in many cases um, in acting roles. And so a lot of the people who are also struggling, it's kind of like a double whammy uh, because the the younger people who are, you know, coming out of film school or writing school, that's who also we need in those rooms. And they're going to kind of take the hardest hit. Exactly. And so many of our members, too, like I'm, I've been on the Writers Guild Council for, this is my sixth year. Oh, it's been a wild ride. And so many of our members in, um, I, I represent folks in the online media sector. So digital media, like Vice or Gawker, well, they're both pretty much gone. But, you know, the newer ones. <laughs> and that's that's kind of a joke, but also like our industry is so unstable that a lot of our members in that sector are looking towards screenwriting and writing mm -hmm. for movies. Like that's kind of one of the big career shifts we've been seeing. And that's kind of, we've thought up until fairly recently, we thought, okay, that's a way to make a little bit of money, get a little bit more stability because journalism is imploding, but at least we have this off ramp and or we can use our skills in this way. But what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the studio executives who may have more money than God and pull in, I don't even know, billions, hundreds of millions, so much money every year for doing nothing, for yelling at their assistants. <laughs> like, like that is one of the things that I think has really been very stark and helped garner a lot of attention for the strike is the <laughs> the studio executives aren't doing themselves any favors. They're really leaning into the whole let them eat cake vibe that worked mm. out so well, you know, in a different <laughs> time in a different place. Talking about how they're they're fine with starving us out, with mm. waiting for us to lose our houses, you know, oh, we're making so much money by not having to pay you. Mm. It's just, it's not a great way to endear oneself to the public. And it's really not a great way to act if you're allegedly the good guys. 
Like good guys don't want people to lose their houses Mm. so they can afford to buy a third yacht. Mm. It's just very, the the amount of money involved in this industry and the visibility of it, you know, a lot Mm -hmm. of people watch TV, a lot of people watch movies. That's helped get a ton of attention that a lot of other strikes and labor struggles don't really get. And it's, been really heartening to see the solidarity that we've gotten from other unions, whether it's our siblings in sag or the Teamsters or IATSE. Starbucks workers are out there. Sarah Nelson mm-hmm. from the flight attendants was just out there on the line. <laughs> like it's, everyone seems to understand like this, this is a big one because it also comes down to the value of human labor because we're facing down this, this issue with AI, artificial intelligence and the way that studios and probably your boss too. Everyone's boss is looking at, you know, how can we use chat GPT or some other evil acronym to take work away from a human? How Mm. can we exploit, how can we like suck out the essence of a human worker and Mm. hold on to it for a century and make sure we don't have to pay them at all? Mm. Like this is the thing they want to, not only do they want to, you know, not pay us very well and not treat us very well. They don't even want us anymore. There there really seems to be this push from that type of studio head, that type of corporate leader, that type of evil boss to try and get the whole messy, needy, nagging human element out altogether and just automate everything. And mm. even if you're not that sympathetic to Hollywood screenwriters or actors, it's going to happen to you too. So mm-hmm. you better buckle up and start paying attention. Um, I want to, I can't not talk to you about the Coney Island Sideshow School. <laughs> because I just, those words together need to be spoken. <laughs> um, you wrote about this um, in in Vox. In 2019, you joined Coney Island Sideshow School. I want to know, how long is the school? Like, is this like a <laughs> six-week? It's like a three-month intensive? How long oh gosh, do you go I to school? Wish. It was... <laughs> It was actually a pretty, pretty accelerated program. Is the, um, and they do, I, I went in 2019 and this is the first year, actually, they brought it back because the pandemic, which is still pandemic but it's pandemic differently. Uh, they, they brought it back this year. Um, but it, it was only, it was like five days. Oh, so it's like a, it's like a, it's an intensive, it's as an it intense, were. And it is intense. <laughs> I ended up, I even, I didn't get to write about that specifically in my book, but there's a reason why there's a section on sideshow workers yeah. in the book, right? Because I was like, well, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it all came about because my, my sweetheart is a Coney Island baby. He's from Coney Island. And wow. back when I lived in New York, I used to spend a lot of time there as one does. And we would go on dates to the sideshow. I would. I thought it was the coolest thing. And one day he's like, "Yeah, I heard they do like a school or something." And I was like, "That's not real." And I looked it up, and it was real. And it was starting in a few weeks. So as a wow. freelancer, I was like, "Okay, I have to trick someone into letting me write about this because I can't afford it because I'm freelance." And, <laughs> and I successfully did that. And I went. I went to sideshow school, and I learned all sorts of interesting things. And the thing about sideshow as an art form, as opposed to magic, for example, is that it is real and it hurts. (laughs) A lot of the skills I picked up, like, you know, breathing fire or walking on glass or setting off a mousetrap with my tongue or sticking my arm in a bear trap or uh, swallowing swords, that stuff is real. Right. It's it's not magic. Well, and it's right. And I think what what's interesting about sort of how you talk about it is also, um, I mean, there there is a, a fascinating history, and you know, um, there's there's so many interesting, there's so much interesting overlap um, between sort of biology and you know the history of sideshows because there are so many things that were you know advertised and and sensationalized that that we know a lot about you know in in terms of of, of medical you know medical significance, um, but you talk about some of the hierarchy, and and I did want to mention this because. Um, you you are what's called a natural born. Yes. And I think what what really touched me, what you said is you found the one place on earth where being you was a plus. And I thought that was so interesting though, because it it connects for me. I hope I hope you don't mind. It connects to fight like hell for me because you you talk about sort of the experience of the individual 
and how we build an entire identity around our needs, you know, our particularities or or things that that don't fit or things that do fit. And you then talked about kind of stepping into a community. And I wonder if you could, you know, kind of maybe compare some of how, you know, your personal experience of stepping into a community and saying, I belong, I'm both unique and I'm also part of, and how that connects to your interest in sort of fighting for the rights of workers, not just as individuals, but as a group. Wow. That doesn't, when you put it like that, it's like, oh, okay, maybe there's something here. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. And for folks listening who are like, what in the world are you talking about? The Cliff Notes version is I I was uh, born with this uh, condition called ectrodactyly, which uh, the cliff notes of that is I have eight fingers and they're arranged in interesting ways. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of other sideshow performers throughout history who had this same thing, uh, usually billed as like a lobster boy or a lobster mm. girl. My my Coney Island stage name was Greta the Lobster Girl mm. because I also have long blonde hair and look a little <laughs> bit like a Swedish milkmaid, you know. So it, it made sense to me at the time. <laughs> but yeah, that experience of going to the sideshow school and being in an environment where There is this kind of inverted hierarchy where folks traditionally in this world, if you're a natural born, if you're born different, you're you're at the top. You're you're top dog. Because you can't fake it. You can't learn it. You can't fake it. Then below that are folks who modify themselves intentionally, whether it's your your tattooed ladies or your lizard men. And then at the very bottom are the people that swallow swords and walk on glass and had to work. They're called the working acts because all (laughs) they can do is work, which I thought was so fun. Um, though now the, the sideshow, at least at Coney Island, you have to, you have to learn how to do stuff too. I can't just stand up there and wave, (laughs) but (laughs) who says all progress is good? Um, no, it's actually, it's great. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, thinking about that experience and then the experience of being a person who got involved in a union who never thought I'd have a chance, right? Like I'm from a blue collar union family. My family are all union and they all work construction or steel work or they were teachers. And I knew, knew unions were a good thing, but I like wrote about death metal on the internet. I didn't think there was like, mm-hmm. you know, local 666 wasn't looking out for me. But uh, it turns out <laughs> that they sort of were, or at least the Writers Guild was. And becoming involved in that way, again, being an individual with my own problems and my own experience and my own issues, meeting up with a whole bunch of other people with their own individual deals and realizing how much we had in common, that really made the light bulb switch flick or light bulb go off, right? Like, okay, this person who I work with, who I don't even really like, they're also having a hard time paying their rent. They're also being treated poorly by this supervisor. We do have some things in common. And if we work together, we can fix it or at the very least make it a little bit better. So the next round of negotiations, we can fix it. That was this sort of seismic feeling. And I'm sure so many of the people I wrote about felt the same way. Because when you're having a hard time or you're a little bit different or both, like it's, it's easy to feel very isolated and powerless and weak. But when you can connect with other people who understand what you're going through on some level, that brings so much power and so much just kind of like, okay, okay, maybe I can do something about this. Maybe this this issue I'm having, maybe or this experience, maybe that's actually a strength. Maybe Mm -hmm. that's something I can use, like whether it's finding out of when I walk onto a sideshow stage and hammer a nail into my face, I'm a little bit extra fun because I have eight fingers (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, finding out in a union negotiation, uh, being a foul-mouthed Jersey girl can occasionally come in handy. It's, <laughs> you know, it's it just shows how how connected we all are and how connected all of our experiences and struggles are and how positive and empowering it can really be to realize like, okay, maybe I'm a misfit, maybe I'm a freak, but so is everybody else. Mm. It almost feels like you're part of, there's a, a club that I just uh, allowing you into people who believe that humans can be really bad, but that humanity can be really good. And it sort of feels like that's, you know, you look into the darkest parts of how poorly humans can treat each other, how poorly humans can see each other. But there's, there's this sort of like 
optimism about you, which I think like if I tried to write what you did there, it would be very hard for me. But I think that's really the beauty of kind of how you present it. Um, and again, I recommend The Untold History of American Labor, Fight Like Hell by Kim Kelly, a fantastic read. And also like um, this is something I'm going to give to my child when he goes to college. Because, like, I really think this is the kind of book, like, when you send your child to college or if you know a child who's entering the world, um, this is one of the most important kind of sets of information, you know, I think that that young people need, especially privileged white children. Anyway, um, before we say goodbye, I have to ask you, you organized the United States' first ever anti-fascist metal festival. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the need for an anti-fascist metal festival and how that came about. Oh, gosh. Oh, I love this. Yeah, it's funny. So many people that come to my work in the labor world don't even know about my entire life as a metalhead, as a metal journalist and promoter and touring. Person. And a real a real pioneer. I mean, especially like a pr preeminent, you know, I mean, females in that space, you know, you're the, the most unicorn of unicorns. <laughs> I was, yeah, and people, some people loved me and some people wanted to kill me about it. That oh, means boy. you're doing something right. <laughs> That's what I told myself. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, for, for a very long time, I um, I guess 20, yeah, I started when I was 15, the past 20 years, uh, especially before I got into labor, I was a heavy metal journalist and a heavy metal everything. Metal's my life. And as I, you know, I grew up in the middle of the woods and didn't know nothing about nobody. And then as soon as I left and got and made more friends and learned more about the world, I realized pretty early, like, oh, OK, women aren't being treated great and they're not being treated great in my scene. Huh. And then I like grew up a little bit more and I was like, wait, a lot of people aren't being treated great and they're not being treated great in my scene. I should say something about this. I should write about this. And so that's what I started to do. And as my political consciousness grew, I became more uh, outspoken about these things, about racism and homophobia, anti-Semitism, all of the bad shit that pollutes our favorite things. And I had also spent a lot of time touring and booking shows and all my friends were in bands. Like I, I was connect, as about as connected as you could be um, in that very specific underground heavy metal world, which is a global phenomenon, but... So we're still kind of a, a niche interest at this point. It's not quite Metallica. But in 2019, I was still working at Vice, where I was the heavy metal editor, which was at one point a job you could have. And I I think I had just texted my friends in this band, Dawn Raid, who are this anarchist black metal band from the UK. I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if you just if I just like brought you guys over to play a show or like did a festival or something? And they're like, oh, you should do that. I was like, huh, maybe I should do that. And I did that. Um, and not just me, of course. My friend Jack helped out. My sweetheart helped out. And then, of course, all the bands and the venue staff. Like, it was a big village tent sort of effort. But, yeah, I put on this this festival called Black Flags Over Brooklyn in 2019. That was like a combination anti-fascist metal festival and kind of like anarchist book fair situation. Um, and it was really lovely. All of the bands were politically on point. Most of them had women or people of color or queer folks or all of the above involved. It was, the crowd was so beautiful. It was so many people that told me they didn't necessarily feel safe at other types of shows, but were having a great time. My friend Rupa brought her kid. Like it was, it was really wholesome for a bunch of bands that were singing about, you know, burning down the patriarchy <laughs> and dismantling <laughs> capitalism at very loud volumes. It was, it was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. And uh, I still have a little bit of money set aside for round two. I just have to, you know, solve the issue of labor versus capital first. Well, we um, we will be standing by. Um, Kim Kelly, it's really so incredible to talk to you. And I just, I think you're amazing. And um, I just, I hope, I hope so many, I hope so many people will be inspired by you as I am. And um you're just freaking awesome. The book and the untold history of American labor fight like hell. Kim Kelly, thank you for fighting the good fight and um, for coming to talk to us about it. Really a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm going to be in L.A. next month. Maybe I'll uh, take you up on that beer. Oh, fun. Ooh. I have so. Oh, I don't know. Where should I take her? I know. Well, Valerie would have to come. OK, we'll, we'll start getting ready. We'll get our nails done. Just kidding. I will, I, I'll get a discount. I've only got no. eight. It's Maya B. Alex Breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. 